When viewed from outer space, our atmosphere appears as a thin blue ribbon, minuscule in comparison to the massive diameter of planet Earth. But it's that thin blue ribbon that protects us from meteoroids, from deadly ultraviolet radiation, and allows the birds to sing. So in this entry of the STEM journals, I discover what the atmospheric sciences can tell us about other planets and our own. Author, musician, meteorite hunter, adventurer. I've led an eventful life. Now I'm exploring exciting STEM careers and recording what I find in the STEM journals. STEM journals, atmospheric sciences. SEDS, or specifically, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, is a program actively engaging students from universities to elementary schools. Amanda Orquiza and her team from the University of Arizona are undergraduates with an experiment that will take them to the edge of space. Is this it? This is your experiment? Yes, it this is It looks like a miniature payload. satellite. <laughs> all right, tell me the whole story. What's it all about? All right, attached to our payload, we have two solar panels right here and right here. We have this laminated so it won't get damaged when it falls. And on board, we do have our flight computer. It's an Arduino Uno microprocessor. Wow. This is pretty high-tech stuff. Yeah. What's your hypothesis? What do you hope to prove by this fascinating experiment? So our hypothesis was that at higher altitudes, our solar panels would be more efficient, so more voltage would be produced. And we actually flew this last semester, and we found out that our hypothesis was true. However, we don't know why it was true, so that's why we are reflying this. Is this the second launch of your career? No, this isn't my second. It's my sixth. Sixth? Yes. You're a veteran. I see that your payload is just one of a bunch. Yeah, we all come up with our own experiments, build our own payloads, and we get to hear what everyone is working on. This whole thing is just super exciting, and to show you how enthusiastic I am about all of this, I brought something special with me, my vintage binoculars. Oh, how cool. <laughs> I'm actually really glad you brought those because you'll actually be able to see the balloon all the way until burst. Really? Yes, you can see it all the way. Do you want to go check it out? This just gets better and better. Yes, please. This is a spectacular parade. Yes. And that's that got to be a heck of a lot of helium in that balloon. Actually, it's hydrogen. Hydrogen? Yes. That stuff's dangerous. Yes, we used to use helium, but there's a helium shortage right now, and it's really expensive, so we switched to hydrogen. Why is there a helium shortage? Actually... Too many people inhaling many... balloons at parties. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it goes! Go. Ah! That's unbelievable. That was fantastic. Okay, what happens now? As you can see, I'm overexcited. Now we're gonna wait for it to burst. It'll get to about 50 feet wide before it pops. 50 feet? Yes, two school buses almost. And well, we, what, we wait here? We have telemetry data on board on some beacons and that gives us the GPS location of the balloon and how fast it's going. Now it's time to go chase it. We're going to go track it, and we're going to go catch it. That's what everyone's doing. Yes, okay. we all have to get going. We have to get going. Okay, okay. Can I Let's ride go. with you? Yes, you okay, may. Okay, thanks. Okay guys, bring it in now. Where is it? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I know. I probably will do that. Oh look, our battery's still working, so it's actually still recording. It's still filming? Yeah, you can say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on an excellent flight. <laughs> So would you declare this flight a success? It looks in pretty good shape. Yes. Hasn't sustained any serious damage, Captain. Nope, it still looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Amanda, Alex. Hi, Jeff. 
Have you had a chance to analyze the data? We confirmed what we found from our first launch that as our payload goes up, the solar panels get more efficient. For this launch, we wanted to see if we could find out why that happened. And we predicted that it may have had something to do with the magnetic field, but when we analyzed our data, we found out that it actually was independent of the magnetic field. So we did a little bit more background research, and um, we determined that as altitude increases, we know from physics that humidity decreases, and we determined that that was the reason why our solar panels were more efficient up there. Really? A difference in humidity? And isn't that why we do science experiments? In my next entry on the STEM journals, I return to Meteor Crater, Arizona to follow up on an exciting meteorological experiment, and it has nothing to do with meteors. STEM journals is sponsored by Copper Point, proud to sponsor STEM education because students who excel in science, technology, engineering, and math will solve the challenges of tomorrow. STEM Journal's personal log. Evidence suggests that our Native American ancestors once roamed North America 50,000 years ago. Imagine the confusion and terror they experienced after a building-sized iron meteorite exploded near what is now known as Winslow, Arizona. Hundreds of square miles devastated. World famous as a site for meteorite and impact studies, Meteor Crater also happens to be an excellent place to study downslope windstorms. With construction complete, Dave Whiteman from the University of Utah and a team of researchers begin their month-long experiment in and out of the crater. So I understand how the tower got here, but I'm still not 100% clear on its mission. This is a meteorological experiment looking at the weather that occurs inside the crater. We're interested in downslope windstorms that occur just over this crater rim. Here we have a 140-foot tower with instruments every 15 feet. We're measuring temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and wind direction at each of these heights. And you've placed a set of instruments at these incremental heights because the characteristics of air are different at different heights. Is that yes, correct? Many people don't realize that, but at night particularly, there's a stratification of the atmosphere and the temperatures change as you go up with height. Also, we're expecting to find a jet in the wind speed at a height about midway up through this tower where the winds are really strong. A wind jet at 60 feet. It's amazing. Those of us who just breathe the air and don't think about it like you do. We, we just don't imagine that there are these different strata up there. Oh yes, it often happens at night, particularly. It's not a balloon, it's an airship. I'm crazy for blimps and zeppelins. We have two of these balloons that we use on the floor of the crater. We launch these during the night. We have a sounding package, it's called a balloon sand, that goes on the line of the balloon, and it pivots around the line of the balloon to give us the wind direction. It has an anemometer that gives us the wind speed, the temperature, relative humidity, and pressure. It has a transmitter that radios the data back to our tent, where we have a computer that gets the data. Fantastic. So, and we also then are interested in the wind field that's inside that temperature inversion. <laughs> and the, the winds come over this rim that you see here, and they push down on the temperature inversion and push it over against this side of the crater. And how often would you do a launch? Is, is this a special occasion? We have a frequency of launch that varies with time during the night. In the early evening, when the atmosphere is changing rapidly, we just continuously make up and down sounding. The same thing in the morning after sunrise. But during the middle part of the night, the atmosphere doesn't change quite as fast, so we have soundings that are about every half hour. Every half hour? Every half hour. I thought this was a special lunch just for me. <laughs> no. Well, I still feel very special. Dave, I see you've got two of my favorite things here, lasers and meteorite craters. It's looking very promising. <laughs> what kind of laser setup have you got? Well, uh, this is what we call a LIDAR. Oh, really? An atmospheric LIDAR. I've worked with LIDAR, amazingly enough, at another meteorite crater. 
at Whitecourt in northern Alberta. In atmospheric science, we use it to measure winds. By pointing the laser beam in a certain direction, we're able to measure the winds along the beam. We're in a perfect location for this because we're able to scan over that rim. And we can even point the LIDAR down into the crater and we can see the wind field down in the crater. How do you interpret all this data? This computer screen shows the data that we received from the Doppler LiDAR. It's beautiful. It looks like an abstract painting. It's so colorful. Is this the crater here that we're seeing? Yes, that's the crater. And the LiDAR is located on the north rim. And it's scanning around 360 degrees, like you see on radar screens. Right. And the colors that you see there tell you whether the wind is coming towards the LiDAR or away from the LiDAR. Uh, nice. What do you hope to achieve by studying this information? Well, as I mentioned, the downslope windstorms occur in mountain ranges all around the world, but we don't understand what conditions are necessary for the windstorms to form. So in this experiment, we're looking at what goes on outside the crater, and then we're looking for the effect to occur inside the crater. So what we'll learn from this is what parameters we need to observe to determine whether windstorms will form. The reason that we're interested in the windstorms is that they have such a societal impact. So you're familiar with the Boulder windstorms. There, when there's a strong, turbulent wind that comes down, it tears houses apart. And if a fire starts, it's very difficult to put out a fire. So it has a lot of very practical applications if we're able to understand the phenomenon well enough from this experiment. Coming up next on the STEM Journals, a NASA mission to study the red planet's depleted atmosphere. STEM Journal Supplemental. We can learn a lot about the history and future of our planet's atmosphere by comparing and contrasting the differences between Earth and its neighboring planets. Roger Yell is a scientist on the MAVEN mission to study Mars's atmosphere and to try and find out why this world is today a barren desert even though it once flourished with oceans, river systems, and perhaps even life. You know, Jeff, it's a great time of year to be in Tucson. We've got this uh, nice green grass and beautiful trees. And what makes all this possible is something you can't see, and that's the atmosphere. The Earth has this atmosphere that allows us to have water on the surface. Mars might have been more like this once. You know, it had a much thicker atmosphere and had water on its surface, but not anymore. Although it's possible, or some say even likely, that there was once life on ancient Mars. There's very good evidence for that. There's rocks that can only be formed in water, and there's dry rivers on the surface. So for sure, billions of years ago, Mars had running water on the surface. You know, one of my favorite, favorite movies is a classic British science fiction film called Quater Mass and the Pit. <laughs> and in that movie, ancient Martians come to Earth. I'm not sure how realistic it is, but it's a good one. Hmm, haven't seen it. Maybe it's unlikely, but it's possible that uh, microbes from Mars hitched a ride on meteorites and came to the Earth. Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere anymore. It's less than 1% the atmosphere that the Earth has. And any more is what you say. This is the part that worries me, that Mars once had an atmosphere. That could happen to us or any planet. Is this something that happened in a catastrophic sense, or did the atmosphere just bleed away over time? Should I be wearing a space helmet? Well, all of those things might happen. Let's sit down, sit down, Jeff, relax. Those things might happen, but they'll take millions or billions of years. Human beings live only a short time, but planets live for billions of years, and they change over the course of that time. For some reason, Mars wasn't able to hold on to its atmosphere. It escaped to space, and we want to understand how that happened and why it happened, what made it happen. That's the point of the MAVEN mission. This project that you're working on could actually help answer some of these questions. Yes, we think it will. Roger, you're an atmospheric scientist. What does that actually mean? Well, on MAVEN, what we want to do is, is um, measure the atmosphere, understand what it's made of and how hot it is, but especially how fast it's escaping. And when we look at all those measurements together, we want to understand 
um, how it's escaping and why it's escaping so that we can apply that knowledge to other places. How does your work with MAVEN relate to the study of atmospheric sciences on Earth? Well, we have this mystery we're trying to solve. In our solar system, we have these three planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And Venus is too hot, Earth is just right, and Mars is too dry and cold. So why is that? It probably relates to atmospheric escape. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I really was paying attention. I was just thinking we could do a remake of Capricorn 1 right here. This is amazing. Don't steal any meteorites. <laughs> this is our Mars yard. We use it to test instruments in a Mars-like environment, so we're sure how they work before we send them off to Mars. I want one. You're welcome anytime, Jeff. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you better be careful what you're saying. You'll wake up one morning and I'll be camped out there with my little tiny portable Mars base. We carefully designed the MAVEN mission, but a little more than a year ago, we got a big surprise. A new comet was discovered, Siding Springs. And believe it or not, this comet is going to fly very close to Mars. And you didn't know anything about that when the MAVEN mission was planned. This was just a bonus. Yes, it's a bonus because it'll affect Mars and we can learn something about the Martian atmosphere from that. But it's also a danger. And it's a danger because the comet... Mars is red. Oh, right. ...is going to fly by Mars at a speed of 144,000 miles per hour. And at an incredible speed like that, even the smallest dust grain could damage the spacecraft. Now, the comet is gonna pass about 86,000 miles from Mars. So Mars is going to pass right through this coma of the comet, and that gas and dust is gonna fall into the atmosphere and should do all kinds of interesting things. So it's a dilemma, what do we do? Do we put the spacecraft in safety mode and stow all the instruments and pray that we don't get hit by a dust grain? Or do we open it up and look at the comet and look at Mars and study this fascinating <laughs> phenomena? What do you think we should do, Jeff? That's a tricky one, and I think we might have to turn it over to my young STEM investigators. Well, I'd like to know what they think. Me too, we'll find out. I've learned how atmosphere is studied from a balloon at the edge of space, at the bottom of a giant meteorite crater, and even on the MAVEN Mars mission. All of these experiments help us better understand the air around us, invisible, intangible, and yet vital to our existence. Coconut mocha? Sounds really weird. So, Becca, you did a really great job on the Trace Rios report, and I would like to work on some more projects with you if you're interested. Hello? Hello? Hey, Becca? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt what you're doing. Um, yeah, hey, listen. One second. I have uh, a very important experiment that I would like to do with you, if you don't mind, so that we can continue our discussion. And it's to do with cell phones and radiation. Put your cell phone on top of my cell phone. Okay, let me just click send really uh, quick. Yeah, now, please. Okay. Because, you know, time is of the essence. That's not my other one. Jeff, why do you have so many cell phones? Oh, well, um, that's the STEM Journal's phone. That's Meteorite Men. That's my personal one, and uh, that's classified. So here's the game. We enjoy a nice lunch, and the first person to answer their cell phone, either to reply to a text or a phone call, pays for lunch. <laughs> what do you think? That's easy. Is it? Yeah, I we'll got see. this. And it's got nothing to do with radiation. So Sarah, you were involved in a program called CREST, which is located at Paradise Valley High School. What is that program all about? CREST is based on biotechnology, engineering, and sustainability. Each student has to pick a branch. So I can see you guys are working on an experiment here. Can you tell me what's going on? Our goal is to create a case that will block radio frequency waves from entering the body. So Sarah explained what we're doing with the case, but first we have to test it here. So First thing we're going to do is actually check the uplink transmission power. Right. So that way we can test what the baseline is before we use the shielding. So what I'm going to do is change the uh, spectrum analyzer out of max hold so it'll clear. And you'll be able to go online and transmit. 
and we'll be able to max hold and see what the actual spikes are when you go online. Most people don't have their phone to their ear as much as they do in their hands. Texting, surfing, doing everything right. they do. So you constantly have this battery microwave power. Some of the cases do well in, in blocking that, that frequency and that power level. A lot of them don't because they haven't tested that far yet. Now with the power that we have, not just battery, but the actual Wi-Fi and everything else that we use for transmission, we want to do is be able to at least block some of that power level because all you're doing is holding it and it's saturated. Right. And as we know, you hold that firecracker in your hand with your hand open, not so bad. You close the hand, boom, a lot more impact. So right. that's what we're looking at right now. All right, so we got some pretty good shielding there now. What does this circular shape have anything to do? Well, it was a, it's as close as we can get to a near-field probe. Okay. So the near-field probe actually will test 3G and 4G. Well, your spikes, you're going to see your transmission spikes already. I can see that the peaks are definitely lower than... Yeah, and now we're only at about, uh, as you can see up there on the left-hand side under the 777 megahertz there, we're sitting at about 14.8 dBmV. I think we did it. I think we did it. That's good. That's what we were trying to do, is lower the radio frequency levels emitted from the phone. Kevin, what inspired you to instruct these students with pursuing their dreams in STEM and cell phone radiation? It's actually yes. kind of fun because I get to come to work and, and this is kind of my, my lab, my mad man cave on steroids. I get to do <laughs> all this cool testing and things like that. And at the same time, when younger generations come along and they, hey, I'm really interested in that, it's kind of what I got interested in. It's a lot of fun. And really technology is. is always a field that will just keep advancing and keep oh, yeah. advancing. Yeah. And there's so many different opportunities. And Changing constantly. That's what I love about right. it. One thing that really stood out to me when I was observing the experiment with the press students is that less is more. When the students use none of the metal slabs on the phone, well, you aren't protected from the radiation. When you use two metal slabs on both sides, all the radiation and heat gets trapped into the phone, which you don't want that. However, if you just use a square of metal slab, put it on the hot spot where the most radiation is, you're covered. You are prevented from radiation. If you want to learn more about atmospheric sciences, don't narrow it down to just one discipline. You want to learn about the physics, the chemistry, the math, the meteorology, even the astronomy. You could be looking at other planets and exoplanets now. This will help you build a broad knowledge base all the way through college. And then once you get into graduate school, that's when you'll narrow it down to become an expert in your field. But no matter what, always be inquisitive, ask questions. That's what doing science is about.